Hey, welcome all my free range followers of Jesus friends out there and saints of Wadesboro. It's glad, glad to be with you this evening. Another Wednesday evening for prayer and for study and I just want to say hello to you and hello Dolly. It's all good to, to see you all this week. Um, this week is a, a challenging one in that we're having several days of prayer and preparation for uh, Saturday Summit. We want to invite you out and make sure that uh, if you have not signed up, please do so by tomorrow morning, uh, either by email, text, or call uh, to let the church office know, let us know that you will be attending. And we're going to, uh, we're planning to do that summit in the fellowship hall and around tables, socially distanced and safe in that way. And we're also trying to put together um, maybe a digital format where people could join us from home, but we haven't solved that one yet. But we, if, if a lot of people do sign up that we're not anticipating and the uh, crowd is too big for the fellowship hall, we'll move to the sanctuary upstairs where there's plenty of distance and we will uh, make sure that we're uh, participating and have everyone um, have the ability to put his or her input into the process and collect data and give your voice sound and, and let your voice be heard as we pray about uh, what is God doing in our community so that our eyes are open and that our ears are open and our heart is open to what God is doing and that we can join God in God's mission here in Wadesboro. Uh, so having said that, I just want to let you know that that's front of mind and front of heart for this coming week in your prayer life, I pray that you give discernment and wisdom and that you would be able to come and participate in some, some way. So uh, this week we want to be in prayer for some folks who have gone to the hospital. Uh, they've not given me permission to just put it out there online, but there are, there's some folks in the hospital that uh, are looking at uh, perhaps some procedures and we want to be in prayer for them and their family as they give care to them. Uh, also just a, a reminder to our, our family ministers to stay in touch with, our, uh, with your charges. Stay in touch with the people with whom you have been placed over them or with them as a caregiver. Uh, we were just talking before this uh, service that mental health issues and uh, rooted in loneliness and isolation are beginning to, to manifest themselves not just in our community but in workplaces. Uh, we are wired for community. We are geared for community. We're called to community. community. And the isolation that some people are feeling, uh, working remotely or living in isolation away from family, uh, not being able to feel the hug of the community that we have so been used to but now long for, it's very important that we uh, take care of each other in a very intentional way, that we devote ourselves and commit ourselves as Paul wrote uh, or, or Paul, um, Luke wrote wrote in the, in the book of Acts that we commit ourselves to the fellowship, that we commit ourselves and devote ourselves to the fellowship. And that means this community first. Before we can take care of things around the world, we need to make sure that our neighbor and our neighbor right now the pew from us uh, is, is well cared for. So just want to remind us of that and I invite you to join me in prayer at this time. Will you pray with me? Thank you, Father, for the joy of being able to come and open your word of life. Father, I, I, I am excited about what you are doing in bringing our congregation into conversation in recognition of your promise that we're two or more gathered in your name, you're among us. And as we are gathered in your name this coming Saturday, we pray that you would truly be among us, that we not only discern, but we worship in spirit and truth. Lord God, that we would be a people that truly is humbled before you and seek your face. And that, Lord, we know that we're just one congregation among many. And that we're just one part of the body of Christ. Lord, we are 
never ones who see our brothers and sisters in other congregations as competition. We see ourselves on mission to complete, not compete. The work of Christ that's been given us around this. And Lord, we would ask that you help us to be faithful with the task to which you have appointed us in this particular part of the body of Christ. We boast no strength. We boast no special gift. All we are is a group of stragglers and, and beggars who are seeking the bread of life and wanting to help others to, to also taste of that bread of life. We are broken and frail. And sometimes we're apt to fail. But in the midst of that, Lord God, your grace and your love and your salvation comes breaking through. Father, we'd ask that you just make us more real so that we may be able to, to respond to you in, in a very real fashion. So, Father, as this discernment period takes place and we see that you really are calling us to to be a part of the completing of your mission here in, in, in Waitsboro and wherever else you would have us touch. That we, we give you praise and we give you thanks for pouring out your spirit upon us. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Tonight, as I said last week, sometimes we are going to need a glossary a dictionary, uh, a playbook, sometimes to understand what Paul is going to be saying to us because he has such a passion for the Jewish people. He has such a passion for Israel. And he has a passion to the people to whom he's been called the Gentiles. And he has spent most of his adult life traveling around the eastern Mediterranean, establishing congregations in Ephesus and Corinth. And we find that this probably was written, written around his uh, third missionary journey around AD 57. And it was probably written from one of the congregations that he had helped establish in Corinth. And the occasion of this book is one, again, as we have already said, that he, he is wanting to introduce not only himself, but the core tenets of the doctrine that he sees as critical and crucial to be held by the Romans when he does come there. Tradition has it that having written this, this letter perhaps from Corinth, he was on his way back to deliver the offering that was going to be made to the impoverished Jewish community, early Christian community in Jerusalem that had long now been under the thumb of Roman oppression and also oppression from the temple and the Orthodox folks in the Jewish community that did not want to and, and uh, to embrace, did not want to embrace the Christian community as part of Judaism, but about 30 years now, gone past Jesus' death, they now were seeing Christianity as something quite apart and quite separate from Judaism, as opposed to being an extension or fulfillment of Judaism. So there was that conflict in the, the heart or the ground zero of that conflict was in Jerusalem. Paul, in going out and establishing congregations around the eastern Mediterranean, he had conflict with synagogues and he had conflict with other folks, but there were a lot of uh, folks who came to understand Christ as Messiah. But so much of what he taught and preached was to a Gentile community. People who had not grown up with the language of Judaism, had not grown up with the sacrificial system and an understanding of the temple. Seriously, uh, this is why when I was teaching Nehemiah, then the intertestamental period, and then the book of Genesis, in some ways, I was trying to replicate what Paul was doing to the early churches and tying it all together, uh, the message that the gospel was a completion and a, a, a full revelation of what God had always been saying about his desire to have this relationship with humanity. If you remember many weeks ago that love desires an object and that love story that that was spelled out from Genesis and we saw how that 
broke down and, and then wanted to be the, the people, wanted to, to be the people of God again in, in Judea. And Nehemiah's story was all about how do we, how do we rebuild and how do we remake and how do we restore the relationship that is broken with God. And Paul, from the very first opening in Romans, in setting the stage of what he hopes to be his missionary trip there, which in fact will be his imprisonment there, because you can read at the end of the book of Acts how he actually ended up in Rome, not from a missionary standpoint, but from a prisoner standpoint. And in Rome he would die during Nero's, uh, uh, during Nero's reign. His writing was wanting to say to the Gentile reader and to the Jewish reader, these words that are the opening lines in, verse, in, in verses 5 and following in chapter 1. Through him, Jesus, and for his, Jesus, namesake, we received grace and apostleship to call people from among all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith. And you also are among those, you being the Roman citizens, the Gentiles, are among those who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. From the very beginning, he is setting into motion an understanding of the righteousness of God. It, 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 is, it is one of those words that we often uh, wrestle with and, and have seen world religions. The important part for this beginning conversation between Paul and Rome and Paul and us is that from the very start he sees that all of this is something that we have received by God's grace. His calling, the gospel, the good news, and the word grace, if you want to, if you want to think of it this way, I know it's a hackneyed, an old saw that maybe you've heard a hundred times in church, that the word grace can be broken out as a as a way of understanding it. God's riches at Christ's expense, G R A C E, God's riches at Christ's expense. You see, grace is a is a is a really more of a of a Greek word that tells us charis, that it is a, it is a gifting, it is a, a gifting of God that is given to a recipient who has not merited any of it. And for us who, who are usual uh, suspects in the drama of relationship, that we can trace all the way back to Genesis and then the brokenness uh, that we read in the original testament and that we identified and worked on and Nehemiah trying to rebuild walls and, and trying to do it right again by, by putting up those walls and excluding others and only marrying certain people. That Paul is pointing us back to the original intent, to the original relationship by saying, it is only by grace that we get God's riches. We don't merit it, we don't earn it, and, and, and I don't know it, it, if you're like me or not, but for me, it, it rubs against how I, I was raised. That you don't get anything for free. That there's nothing that doesn't come without a, a hard work and that you earn or you deserve. But you see that once we put that language in, even in church, in faith terms, that you've got to obey and you've got to be good enough and you've got to show these things and these fruits when we start putting the conditional language in that we've moved away from from grace because it is the, the good news of Christ that, that Paul is going to be teaching us he's going to show a level set a level ground around the cross where all of us have fallen short I'm going to fast forward to chapter 3 there for a second that all of us have fallen short all of us have sinned all of us have forsaken the glory of God. And that it is God's move to us first. Now you want to think about a radical concept to, to the human condition. Now this is not a comparative religion course. 
But I want to simply, in context, say that in the development of world li wisdom literature and world wisdom traditions, you can pick one. And even in Judaism, as it, as it migrated more and more and more to works, in the world of wisdom tradition and, and in religion, Christianity is the only world religion thought process and faith process that says God moves first towards humanity, which is sinful, which is broken, which is unhealed, which, is, which doesn't deserve that initial step of relationship. That God came down, that God in flesh, God came in Christ, God shared our humanity. The book of Hebrews puts it this way, that we have a high priest who, like us in every way, has been hurt, tempted, flawed, but never sinned. Because God loved us so much, he sent, if you remember John's contact and, and writing of Nicodemus and Jesus exchange. It, it begins with God's initiation. And that's why going even back to, to Genesis, Paul is thinking all of this is grace upon grace. God spoke and it was created. There was nothing that humanity contributed to the process. There's no other creator that created with God or was a co-creator. God spoke it was. God created it was. And he thought it was very good. And that's why we, we, we want to go back to those, those texts to tie them in because no other book that Paul would write in the New Testament has more references to the original Testament. He wanted the Gentile and the Jew to understand this God, this Jesus Christ, this divine one, this Messiah is the God of all people. Not just one God among a pantheon of gods like in Rome or in Greece or in the Viking pantheons, but this is one God. And it's going to be radical what Paul says through this to the Gentile hearers and to the Jewish hearers as it unfolds. But I want us to understand where he starts with grace. It is a grace that we received. And the apostleship, his calling, he also says, we received. Anytime I think, and, and many years I sat on the board of ordained ministry with the Methodist Church and then uh, also did interviews with uh, pastor wannabes uh, when I was at Presbyterian College and even at Wingate, some of the folks, that students who would come through. And, and I would, they would say, well, how do you know that you were called? How do, how do you know that it's really from, from God? And, and there was an old pastor that had taught me early on in, in ministry who advised me. He said, Harry, if there's anything else you can do and you really want to do, go do it. But if you wake up every morning and in the middle of the night you feel God is speaking to you and you you find yourself praying or weeping or feeling uh, a, a compassion and empathy with others that you don't even know and you hurt them and, and you begin to seek out how is God speaking to me and to them. If it's, if it's something that occupies your waking and sleeping moments, then don't do anything else and don't let anything stop you from doing it. And I, I understand that. I understand that, and I understand that from Paul's conversion uh, testimony in Acts and then later in Galatians when he alludes to it, that it's a life transforming something that came from outside of Paul's self. Something that if it's a calling on your life, and if it's something that is, that is vocatio, as we've talked about, it's vocation, it's calling, then it's gonna occupy not just your intellectual thoughts, but your being. You'll interrupt your leisure. And that's why he can talk about it. And, and when it's a real calling of God into our lives um, in the church, not just for pastoral, I'm talking about laity pastors as just Christians. Look for that place where the passion is alive in you. 
look at that place where the deepest needs of the world meet your deepest desires to serve. And you will find a place where your calling is taking place. Too many people are trying to fit themselves into apostleship or teachership or preachership. When Paul will write in Romans 12, but he also did in 1 Corinthians 12 and 13, that there are many gifts. And all those gifts are for, for the good of the body of Christ, not for us, not, not for us who, who receive them. Because the important part for Paul here is grace, the salvation that he would receive because of what God did, God's riches at Christ's expense, and his calling, the apostleship, the witness of the resurrected Christ and commissioning from that as a passion for the Gentile folks to come together. And who does he call to? He's called to call all of the Gentiles to the obedience. Now listen to this word construction because again, it just is so counter to the way you and I often think about living out church, living out faith, living out our spiritual being. We receive grace and apostleship to call people from among all the Gentiles to the obedience. Now if I just stop there, everybody would go, yeah, yeah, that's what we're supposed to do. We're just supposed to be obedient. And we're supposed to follow the rules and supposed to be good people. And hopefully we'll be good Christians. Listen to the sentence. To call people from among all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith. Once again, faith comes from grace, which we receive, and we will hear him say in just a just a few moments from from now in the letter that the, the gospel is a righteousness that is received from God, a righteousness that is fed by faith from first to last, just as it's written. That's what he's writing in chapter 1, um, verses 16 and following, and why he was not ashamed of the gospel. We so often try to put the cart before the horse. We so try to put obedience before the relationship with Christ that we receive through faith. And Paul is wanting to set it up right now, right front. He wants to get it out of the way right up front. Grace calling and faith are the sources from which we are able to obey. Paul's going to write later and we'll, we'll see it. He struggles with the flesh. He struggles with, with that sense of obedience and that's why faith has to come first. The good that I do, I don't do and the very thing I hate, I, I do it. You tell me you don't ever feel like that? That you don't ever give in to the flesh, you don't ever give in to your thought process, you don't ever think about the things you shouldn't think, or maybe you say the things that you shouldn't say. I know I'm human. And there's an unregenerate redneck that still resides in the back of my mind that I have to allow Christ and his grace and his riches of God's righteousness to be imparted to me so that I might have faith, and from that faith, lean into obedience. I can't do it with my own strength. And Paul is saying, none of us can. And that's, that's the thing that sets the Christ followers from uh, apart from all the other world traditions because all the other world traditions are, I'm going to be obedient. And if I'm obedient enough, and if I sacrifice enough, if I beat my skin, and if I subdue my flesh, and I deny myself in all these ways, somehow I'm going to appease and somehow I'm going to earn and somehow I'm going to merit God's love for me. You know, it's that kind of thought process that led Sigmund Freud to talk about God as, a, as an illusion and it's just a projection to the critical parent that maybe he grew up with. Paul is Paul has seen the resurrected Christ, the one who was crucified, raised from the dead, who spoke with him. He saw that the riches of grace to an undeserving 
broken person. He saw how we are remade and reborn. And it's in this moment that he is saying, I, 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 I want to come to you, but I want to set it straight first before I even get there. You can't earn it. That the obedience that you are, are striving for, you will fail every time unless it comes from the faith, from the grace that God has given you. And he reminds them, because of that faith, even though the Gentiles have been excluded from the temple and the synagogue and not included in God's promises, and he'll talk about that more clearly in a minute, you also are among those who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. If you've ever struggled with your belonging, this word is for you. And I know I've said this several times through the study of Genesis and Nehemiah, but this is the, this is the gospel. This is where Paul is saying, I want you to look backwards to the original testament to what God has always been saying. Let there be a correction in your worldview, correction in your doctrine, correction in how you perceive the relationship with God to understand that you belong to Jesus Christ when you have accepted him and, and, and just said yes to him and received his grace. And he says to all in Rome who are loved by God and called me saints. And he finished this, and I just want to say this word about saints. People would say, hey, you, you say good morning to the saints in Wadesbury or Wadesboro and to all the free range Christians. You see, saints, the basic idea of this Greek word is, is holiness. And all Christians are saints. But see, again, we have been poisoned. We have been jaded to think of sainthood as obedience only. As somehow somebody is perfect to be a saint. But it's not. In this, in this context, in this in the original word and in the concept of, of a saint is someone who's set apart for God and it's a positional holiness. It has nothing to do with your ability to obey. It is your positional holiness in relationship to God. You have received God's righteousness through faith and positionally you have been moved to this place of being set apart from God, for God and you're a saint. Because you have the ability to love and receive love and respond to God's spirit. It's a positional move of being a set apart for God's work. Well, he greets them now, and this is where we'll end tonight. Grace and peace to you from God, our Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, grace and peace, grace a Greek word, God's riches at Christ's expense, and peace, a Hebrew word he combines in here with shalom, which means a wholeness. So not only are you positionally, Paul saying, grace to you, grace to you. Positionally, you belong to God, it's from God, grace from God, God grace from the Lord Jesus Christ. God's riches and peace, wholeness. These two combine in a rare and, and uh, philosophically wonderful way that is unique to the, the, to the first century greetings. Usually the Greeks would come out with the, great, with the grace and the Hebrew folks with peace to you. And he's combining them in such a way that already he's speaking to a unity in the Gentile and Jewish world that, that, that people didn't understand and were long to, they were longing to see that positionally God is doing something because he says right again in just these three, these three verses it's from God that the real peace that we can have in this world is from God the real grace that we receive is from God 
So brothers and sisters, we're going to stop there tonight. But if you're longing for that security and positional relationship with God, if you're longing for that wholeness, the peace that passes understanding, there is no other source this world can offer because it comes from God. And it is my prayer and my hope that as we study this, that, that your mind and heart will be flooded with the light of Christ in a way that gives you a, 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 a growing sense of confidence in who you are and who we are in Christ and how we can combine together as the body of Christ to proclaim the good news to a, a very hurting world. Hope to see you Sunday. God bless you.